Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're doing another episode of our Jurassic World Evolution 2 mod spotlights. We take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and compare them to their real life fossil counterparts. And today we've got a lot of pickle mods coming up. We all know we love his uh, remodels and things like that. A couple of new species and um, something really, really cool that you see in the thumbnail, of course. And we'll get to that as we go through. But we're going to be starting off today with an uh, edit by Pickle. Uh, we have got his Triceratops. So as you can see, this replaces the very, very ugly, in my opinion, Jurassic World Triceratops, but changed it to look much, much better. So let's take a looky loo. Have a look at you since you're so pretty and I like the pattern on you. So this is based on Triceratops horridus, which is one of the two species of Triceratops. Uh, horridus is the earlier one and it evolved into Porosus right at the end of the Cretaceous and or at least believed to be and the main way you can tell them apart is that uh Horridus has a much bulkier skull and a much smaller nasal horn so the one at the tip of the snout here is much smaller on uh Prorosis has got a much more leaner skull and a much more prominent uh, nose horn it's kind of the easiest way to tell them apart at least from the skulls but we can see that is definitely Horridus so we can move over to the face here and have a great look so I believe this is kind of based on your typical hatcher specimen who's Horridus. But you can see that wonderful face. You can see that big beak that would obviously be used for biting through plants and uh, branches and twigs and things like that. And they very parrot-like so superficially. And you can see that smaller brow uh, nose horn going up here. And then you have that big bulky head and also these wonderful eyes. Also got the jugal there as well. And then you can see one difference as well, I believe, is that these guys still have the ossicones on their uh, uh, frill, as you can kind of see going on there. And I think Porus has kind of lost it and they've got much more of a smooth frill. But yeah, really, really nice regardless. Looks really, really cool. And you can see those large brow horns that really gives the uh, three-horned face its name. And it looks a little bit more conservative compared to uh, other reconstructions in terms of keratin. But typically keratin on uh, like bovid horns and things like that and this has been confirmed also by a lot uh it seems on average kind of keratin is usually adds an extra half to uh, a horn or something so the bone core is like that and then you add another half of that and that's kind of um how big the horns typically are it's kind of that general relationship so you can see that applied here you could argue a bit of wear and tear from being a living animal but still really really cool regardless i do love that head really really cool and then we move to that big round body we can see that big round triceratops body that we all know and love ceratopsians in general have a very round oval body almost like an egg and you can see they've got these very massive forelimbs that are a bit more squat which probably helps bring their head closer to the ground and maybe helps lower their center of gravity for charging and then we can see some changes to the feet so we can see uh the digits four and five are not really uh got nails on them but the first three do and they've also got this like real fleshy foot going on which is really really nice does fit with what we know of triceratops feet so really really cool really big bulky legs then we move over to those thighs they have these really really big thighs and especially because these guys are bird hip dinosaurs so that's a little bit confusing because you have your lizard hips but the birds evolved from lizard hips dinosaurs so that includes theropods and sauropods but the bird hip dinosaurs that includes like your hadrosaurs and all of this and things like that uh they didn't they have the bird hips but they uh didn't evolve into birds so it's very weird but it's a really cool example of convergent evolution so they have the issue in the pubis coming around here lots of space in their guts for fermenting uh, uh plant matter and see the big bulky legs the big thighs the big sturdy legs with the four nails on it there and kind of the soft pad at the back there as well so it looks really really nice and that very stereotypical uh short ceratops ceratopsian tail which looks really really nice 
looks pretty good for the most part. The only thing that probably change is like a little bit of more bulk around the neck. It's got a kind of a skinny neck, I'll be honest. But other than that, I think it looks pretty great. Probably just holding it a little too high. But also, we do have pretty good skin impressions from uh, Triceratops. And we know that they had these very, very large hexagonal... Uh, hex oh, I can't even say it properly. Hexagonal... Uh, <laughs> I can't even say it. Um, big, large hexagonal scales. That's it. And then they had the, almost these large, quote-unquote, nipple scales that kind of came out like that. Instead of this more kind of flat texture that um, this one has got now. But um, other than that, it's pretty spot on. You could even argue that maybe Poros has had that and uh, Horridus may have been a bit more smooth. That would be kind of weird considering, uh, in, at least design-wise, because it's got the big bulky. It kind of fits it better, I think. But yeah, really, really cool. A really big fan. I like the colors as well. I think the colors actually translated pretty well uh, from the Jurassic World one onto the uh, accurate one. So this is our Triceratops Horridus. Really, really cool. So we're going to let you run off and do your thing. So it was done by Pickle. And next up, we've also got done by Pickle. We'll let them walk off and do their thing. Next up by Pickle, we've also got some remakes of his uh, uh, Allosaurid pack. So we're going to be starting off with the smaller one. We got Metroacanthosaurus. So Metrocanthosaurus, as cool as it is, it's a bit of a difficult one because Metrocanthosaurus is actually not known from uh, very much skull material or anything. It's really only known from a little bit of the gastralia, a little bit of uh, caudal and uh, uh, other vertebrae and the hips and with a thigh bone. But uh, we know its relatives as well, so it's usually reconstructed based on its relatives. So that includes things like Synraptor and um, Simotyrannus, so those kind of animals, including Anxiosaurus as well, they're related to. More related to Asian kind of Allosaurids rather than the American ones like Allosaurus itself. Yeah, really, really cool regardless. I do love this guy, look at him. But you can see some changes in the face there. Really, really like that face, uh, like those changes there. Much better fits something like Sidraptor and much closer to what it's related to. And then you have that kind of S-shaped neck that they have. And they've got these big arms, and they're properly uh, not pronated as well. They're kind of clap, 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 as I always mention. Perfect. And then we can see that uh, long body there. It's just that this is kind of those really minor ones. But you can see it just those little edits make the dinosaur look a little bit more realistic. You can see also the body much more rounded. And because the Australia would come down here and then join the pubis there. And then kind of come up like a big thing going up here. The boot is down here. It comes up. And they probably sit on that as well. And you see the uh, vertebrae coming down there. And these long, long legs and the smaller feet. Uh, much more bird-like than a lot of people uh, draw. And then you can see that large tail. The tails are typically made way too short in Jurassic Park. Seems to be just the case of um, uh, people's designs. They often make the tails way too short, but really, really nice. And these guys were a medium-sized kind of carbon wall. They got about 7-8 meters long and a little over a ton. It's still a really, really cool animal, I think. A very interesting in history as well. It's one of the first dinosaurs. Like, It was originally considered Megalosaurus, but um, of course it was split into its own thing. It comes from uh, the UK as well, I believe, Oxford Clay. So it comes from the late Jurassic. So very interesting uh, history there as well. But yeah. Really cool. Nice to see a nice pickle edit. I do love pickle edits because pickle has my same sens same sensibilities as uh, in terms of paleo art and things like that. So really, really cool. So I'll let them run off and do their thing. So uh, move away from the front there, little man. So next up, we have got uh, going to the uh, famous Allosaurus, and they run loves. Also done by Pickle, uh, another paleo edit here. So this one's a little bit more dramatic as you can see. Uh, we'll start with the skull first, that seems to be the biggest changes. So we can see that wonderful skull. Seems to be based on Allosaurus fragilis, but that's often the more common uh, one that's always based off. 
uh, we can see some of the changes to the crest here, much more like a rounded skull. And you can see it's uh, very like awkwardly boxy, yeah, but really, really flat, but I really like that. And you can see this large crest that um, Allosaurus Vagilis had. It seems like the crests uh, had a lot of keratin on them, and they were very likely used for display, uh, potentially for social uh, or sexual selection. Very, very cool. Um, we can't really prove that objectively, of course, but we can see the big lips as well. I do love the lips. Uh, these guys are very similar to later Kikarodontosaurus. These guys didn't have the big bulky jaws of like Tyrannosaurus. These guys are more adapted for shearing rather than crushing. But they still probably had a pretty nasty bite force. And even a 10 to 12 meter long like Saurophaganax, if that is considered Allosaurus, which I believe is most likely just an adult Allosaurus, uh, that would very likely be still have quite a powerful bite of like at least a couple tons. So it's pretty interesting. But um... We can see also the spikes on the original one has been toned down a bit when they've kind of made little osteoderms. I kind of miss them, but I'm sure there's a version out there if you really wanted to. There's a version maybe uh, if um, Becker wants to make that, just leave the spikes normal. It'd be cool. I like the spikes. I think it gives it a really interesting profile. But um, you can see the Allosaurus got that very uh, S-shaped neck, really charismatic to it. And you see that round body to him. Let's have a look. Let's have a look at you. You probably show it off a little bit better. Very big round body and these very large arms. And they do have these very big claws. You can see the first claw is the biggest and the second one is the longest and the, the, the smallest. So these guys were very much probably grappling prey with their arms and using and you probably even holding them so they can get their jaws on them uh, to try and grab flesh and things like that. So that's pretty cool. Also got a quite roundish body, as you can see that, like that there. You get the gastrella come down here, the pubic boot. And then you have these long, long legs, and these feet have been made slightly bigger, I believe. They kind of fit a lot more with uh, the feet of uh, kind of birds, rather than the stereotypical like Jurassic Park kind of thunderous feet. A little bit leaner and meaner, you could say. And they've got this quite long tail. Seems like it's been extended a bit as well. It looks really, really nice. I'm definitely a big fan. The only thing I'd change personally is probably just put the spikes back on because I quite like the spikes. Though there's no evidence for that. But um, one thing as well is that the size of the Jurassic Park Allosaurus probably fits a lot better with Saurophaganax, which is often considered uh, synonymous with Allosaurus, be that the same species or even just, just adult fragilis or something like that. It's kind of a taxonomic, uh, taxonomic mess, so... Uh, it just kind of is what it is, but really, really cool regardless. All these pickle edits really doing well over here. So let them run off and do their thing. So uh, next up, we're moving on to uh, Jacerba. So the last two animals, I've already covered these two before, but now they're new species and part of the mollusk pack. So we're going to have a look at uh, Tuzotuthus by Jacerba. So let's have a look at these guys. So we can see these wonderful, cool little guys here. So Tuzotuthus means crushed squid. So a very interesting name. And these guys are a type of cephalopod that lived during the Cretaceous. When it was first kind of described, it was initially interpreted as pretty much just a prehistoric version of today's giant squid. Because its mantle was estimated to be pretty similar to the size of that. And fossils have been found in the Western Interior Seaway of North America. So around then. During the late Cretaceous, it's been found in like Kansas, Colorado, Wyoming, Dakota, and Manitoba. And one species was uh, traditionally recognized, uh, uh, Tuzotuthus longa, but in 2019, due to uh, poor holotype, the genus Tuzotuthus is likely invalid, and it's actually considered to be later described better in the genus uh, Usotuthus, or if you say that instead. So Tuzotuthus is kind of still a thing, but it's been renamed into Yokotuthus, I believe you say that they're included in that genus and um american paleontologist william they not originally kind of explained the etymology of that so it means crushed squid and because it was uh, the gladys which they used to estimate the size which isn't um was quite fragmented when they found it and it was also assumed to prey on other cephalopods and fish and potentially even small marine reptiles 
And it was also prey for other animals such as many predatory fish and mosasaurs potentially. And a fossil of the predatory abdoliform um, Chalonichthys was actually found in the gullet of uh, Tusotuthus. And the back portion of the stomach region with the mouth was made open so that just the fish was actually in the middle of swallowing that cephalopod uh, tail first. And research actually strongly suggests that the fish swallowing Tusotuthus uh, head anchor remains outside the mouth and thus blocking the gills and kind of suffocated as it swallowed its prey. So that shows how that animal died while it was eating a Tusotuthus. But um, the original genus now is um, Eucotuthus, which means spear squid. And um, it lived during the Cretaceous I mentioned. It is relative often compared to squid, but now they're thought to be more closely related to octopi. And the estimated mantle length is about 2 meters, so about 6 foot 7. And based on specimens described at Tusotuthus, so it's basically considered equal to that of a giant squid, but they have a very different anatomy. So this is one's very much inspired by kind of Dumbo octopuses. So, um, but due to what has been related to, instead of being a 12 meter long, pretty much prehistoric giant squid, it's now a 3 meter, like, um, giant Dumbo octopus, at least it's interpreted as here, which is pretty interesting. But these guys, uh, Inusotuthus means uh, spear squid, which is quite an interesting name. And uh, all the species pretty much lived in Kansas, uh, Wyoming, and the West Interior Seaway. Though there's another species known from Australia, from the Cretaceous Eomaga Seaway. And another, an unnamed specimen comes from the Paleo-Pacific Ocean of North America and found in Alaska of Uzotuthus. But the large one, which was formerly Tuzotuthus, is from the Western Ontario Seaway. So, very, very cool animal, and I love this interpretation. Really looks like a cute little octopus. So, really, really cool. So, let them swim off and do their thing. So, next up, we've got Camaraceros. A very interesting animal. So, also done by Jaserba as part of the Mollusk Pack. We'll have a look at this one. I think this would be a perfect one to look at because he's quite big and beautiful. But um, we've got Camaraceros, which means chambered horn. These guys were a genus of extinct large ornithocone that lived during the Ordovician, so right in the Paleozoic, uh, about 470 million years ago. And it was quite common in shallow seas and uh, Siberia and the Baltic area and things like that. Um, the last remnants of these guys were found in Wedlock, and they probably uh, their populations became severely reduced after the Ordovician to Lorraine extinction. And um, there's a few species known, and the largest species known was about a meter long. But in older literature, there was uh, this large animal was considered to be about six meters long, or even up to nine meters or thirty feet. Though those larger specimens are now considered their own genus, um, Endocaris. Uh, Gigantium, which is their own species, and the 9 meter specimen is highly doubtful, but the larger specimens believed to be the genus of um, Endocerus, as we'll talk about soon. So these guys are cephalopods, so they're a taxon, or which is, means head foot. They're related to octopuses, squids, and cuttlefish. And for comparison, these guys are quite similar to nautiloids, or the sh as they have the long shell and with different chambers that allows them to control their buoyancy. But unlike nautiloids and ammonites, uh, these guys have a, like a straight shell rather than a curled up shell. And then the tentacles would come out from the base, and these guys would have been using it to manipulate prey and things like that. And at the base, they would potentially have a lots of hard carrots and beak, and then being strong enough to uh, bite through kind of. Uh, endoskeletons of prey and all shells and with a beak they would have a radula so that would allow them to like rasp off soft uh, tissue for them to eat and um Camaraceros is often considered a waste bucket taxon so uh that means basically a bunch of genera just thrown into it because they all look similar uh genuses such as endocaris uh have been split from that and um it was actually described in 1847 with a few different species as I mentioned described and knowing the kind of uh, environment or, or lifestyle or habits, they were almost certainly stalkers or ambush predators. At the large, um, they were probably laying around on the seafloor, things like that, because that really large rigid shell probably made it a little bit more difficult for these guys to maneuver around. 
And the larger ones in particular would have been not very active swimmers, and the largest may have actually like remained at the bottom without even changing their position. So that's quite interesting. And it was all um, endo um, cirrids. Uh, these guys were uh, kind of weight, so they were horizontally stable. So they would have been able to achieve by the endocones on the spherical. So these guys were able to change kind of their um, ballast, and so they could move forward. Uh, and they have centrally located chambers, so they're able to kind of change their buoyancy with having little effect on their horizontal stability. So it kind of allowed them to stay horizontal, even though they've got such a long shell, they're able to take the different chambers and kind of help them go up and down without uh, kind of like flipping forward or going up. So they were able to stay horizontal even when diving. So that's pretty interesting. And we'll talk about endocaris because I think it's worth talking about. So endo... Um, Endoceros, if you say that. It means inner horn in Greek. These guys are a large straight shelled cephalopod, as I mentioned, very closely related to uh, Chimeraceros. Um, but um, these guys live during the middle to upper, upper Ordovician, so about 485 to 490 million years ago. And cross section, these guys' uh, mature position was slightly wider but at high, and they have a large uh, spherical located on the ventral margin. And it's been seen especially in young animals, but they're still quite similar. It's quite tubular in their adult stage, but still quite similar as well. Uh, these guys were described in 1847 as uh, by Hall, and they were quite widely spread across the world, especially in North America and Europe, and some have been found in Australia. They're quite similar to, as I mentioned, Chimeraceros, but um, the two often sometimes considered the same uh, genus, though they're sometimes split with the larger specimens being an endocaris. And um, mature, fully grown endocaris were likely ambush predators and laid in weight and to grab advantage. And younger individuals who had compressed uh, cross sections may have been more actively mobile and kind of niche partitioning from young to adults. And in terms of size, uh, the species Endoceros gigantium measured about 3 meters long or about 10 feet long is preserved. But the most recent estimate puts a complete size about 5 0.7 meters or about 18.7 feet which would make it the largest cephalopod bite length in the fossil record and there was also records of a 9 meter long or 30 foot long uh, shell but that was destroyed so just another extreme individual that we know nothing about but really really cool do love these guys another excellent addition from Jaserba's uh, mollusk pack so that's all seven done really really cool we'll let them swim off and do their thing so next up, we're moving on to some more dinosaurs again. So going back to Pickle for his Allosaurid uh, pack uh, update, we have got Cacarodontosaurus. So this one I quite like. So this is, uh, let me sneeze. No, wait, no, I'm not going to sneeze. Am I going to sneeze? No. Um, anyway, we've got Cacarodontosaurus, another pickle edit. So we're going to be starting off with the head. What I really like is that it really gets that look of the Cacarodontosaurus. Cacarodontosaurus is a very tall and uh, skull. You kind of see there and very uh, thin as well. Very well adapted for shearing rather than crushing prey. So very similar to uh, like Giganotosaurus. And these guys lived with um, Polurotitan and some very large animals and hadrosaurs. Uh, so these guys would have been most likely um, shearing rather than biting and crushing like Tyrannosaurs would as uh, these guys were feeding on much softer prey in comparison. And you can see what I really like is that the original design as much as the skull looked wonky, I like how some of the cool bits, like all the knobs on their head, were kind of incorporated into this design. You can see there's kind of knobs here uh, on the um, crest here, because often these guys often have crests, and you can see that keratin going on there. It comes up here as well. I think it looks really, really nice. Really adds to the design, and I kind of like this big one here. So potentially could have been used for like rutting and things like that, maybe. That's kind of a cool idea. But um, very unlikely, but I do just, just like how that design is. Very cool interpretation of the keratin that they had. And then you can see, obviously, that quite long and wide, uh, thin skull. You see that there. But really characteristic of Cacarodontosaurids. 
Then you can also see that neck, very bulky neck, and they've got this very, very almost similar to like Acrocanthosaurus. It's got very high uh, spines down the back, and you can see it is quite, uh, gives it a quite uh, interesting profile as it's kind of like almost like a table. You can see probably uh, anchor point for a lot of muscles uh, to uh, help with grabbing things and things like that, just being bigger, muscly animals. And then we can look at the arms here, the Cacaronotosaurids, being Allosaurids as well. These guys would have had uh, three-fingered hands, unlike the two-fingered hands of Tyrannosaurs. And these guys, obviously, their hands are kind of much, much smaller. Uh, Megaraxes, which is one I haven't been able to talk yet because no one's really made one. Uh, we have um, evidence that a lot of those animals were actually, their arms were shrinking. Very similar trend to like Tyrannosaurs as well. But these guys still had decently large arms with the three-fingered claws, as you're going to see here. So they were most likely using those to grapple prey or scratch or even maybe do some social displays with them. So they weren't completely useless. They were kind of just smaller so they could have a larger head. Because if you have big head and big arms, it's hard on a two uh hard on a like a two-legged frame because you gotta obviously balance that out. Is that alright? A little bit of a um Is that on this one? Yeah it is. There's a little bit of a uh, thing there uh, that pickle might need to fix that but anyway we have a look at the feet uh, one thing that's really cool as well is that we can see one thing i've mentioned as well megaraxes also known for having this larger claw so um this has kind of been added to giganotus uh, it's added to giganotosaurus as well as i'll get into but also kakaratontosaurus has it uh, from this model so this would have been most likely uh, it's founded Megaraxes and Megaraxes seem to have had this it's not it's been compared a lot to like a Dromaeosaur claw but uh, it most likely the best comparison I would say would probably be the modern Ceremus that include the red and black legged uh, Ceremus so these guys were using uh, these claws to potentially just hold down prey as they rip it apart so basically like a built-in uh, fork so able to just hold their prey down and rip it apart though they potentially could rear up and kick each other with it so that, that would be a pretty interesting paleo art if someone wants to do that rearing up kicking each other and maybe even to slash prey a little bit but they wouldn't be using them in the same way as dromaeosaurs they wouldn't be like aiming for the neck or trying to grapple on their prey like with rpr or raptor prey restraint they wouldn't be able to do that so very it's a great example of kind of convergent evolution especially within dinosaurs since all these dinosaurs are theropods um, and you can see the feet are slightly bigger and longer i do quite like that really fits nicely and then we can see that body there very bulky round body obviously you have the gastrella coming down here and then the uh, pubic boot that way and then you see they've got this quite long tail with that uh, little uh, uh, bug there i don't know what you can call it just a little, just a little bit of a hole might need a bit of a fix but you can see that tail's also been a little bit extended makes it look uh, much longer as i keep mentioning the jurassic park dinosaurs often their tails are way too short but um i really do love it i really like the color as well i think it's translated perfectly and i love the texture on it as well really really cool big big fan so we're gonna let you walk off and do your thing oh you're gonna stand over there and do your social thing let's watch it why not friends I like the sounds let them run off and do their thing so next up we've got one that we mentioned as well we've got Giganotosaurus also done by Pickle uh, part of the uh, Allosaurid kind of remaster pack So let's see if we can get one, maybe. No, I think what we'll do is just get rid of a little patch of ground quickly so I can show off the toes. Yeah, we'll start with there, but we'll look at you. So look at these are wonderful guys. So we some, see some minor changes going on here. So this one I've covered recently, but I can see there's definitely been some changes. See some changes to the skull there. I think it's made a little bit taller. 
And you can see this kind of bigger lips coming around, I quite like that. I like that crest as well, I think it translates pretty well. You see they've got the large hyoid as well, I like the hyoids. Hyoids is, anchors a lot of the muscles of your tongue and things like that. It's kind of put in there. Much bulkier, I think it's based on a like more recent Dan Folks kind of skeleton. Or skeletal. Looks quite nice, you can see that changes to the head. Often, uh, Trigonotosaurus used to be reconstructed with a really, really long skull. Like, if you look at the 90s reconstructions. But mo re most recent reconstructions actually, like, shrink that down a little bit. So he's got a little bit of a taller skull. But um, I think it just still looks really nice regardless. I'm definitely a big fan. I like the newer interpretations. And plus, I think it fits well on the Jurassic Park model. And I love the spikes. The spikes have been, I think, greatly exaggerated, as you can see going down the back and neck here. Really helps it make it look a little bit different than uh, Cacarodontosaurus. And, um, yeah, I think that's cool. But um, we've also seen a little bit on the mouth here. Reminds me of, like, green iguanas, because often then they have a dewlap. They have, like, big uh, spikes going down there, or big scales going down like that. I think it looks really, really cool. And I think it fits the design of this guy pretty well. So some changes there. Uh, some little bit changes to the neck. So these guys would have had uh, quite strong necks as well. So they carry that large head and also to help rip apart flesh. So it's really, really interesting. And we can see there are some changes because this is uh, based on Megaraxes. Because Megaraxes is actually pretty complete for a large theropod. So what's really, really cool is that um, these guys have got slightly smaller arms. As these guys are later than Meraxes. They are closely related to Meraxes. But um, same, found in the same formation, but Megaraxes is older than uh, Giganotosaurus, uh, no, Mapusaurus, I was thinking Mapusaurus. But yeah, they are related, so you can see those arms here. Shrunk down a little bit, because it seems like very similar to Tyrannosaurids, Giganotosaurus, uh, uh, and um, even like the Giganotosaurini tribe. Which includes like Mapusaurus, Tyrannotitan, Megaraxes, and Trigonotosaurus, and Mapusaurus, things like that. They most likely were losing their arms a little bit, uh, just to, uh, just so they didn't have to worry about balancing a large head and a large pair of arms. But they still look quite functional. They still have the three claws and like the two claws of T. Rex, and probably quite good at slashing and grabbing things. And uh, so in that same vein, based on Megaraxes, also we've got. Um, this large claw, as I mentioned, very similar to uh, Dromaeosaurs, but most likely in, in ecology, much more used, similar to like Cerimas, where they would potentially hold down prey. They could have potentially kicked each other, like maybe like cassowary type fighting. That could be pretty cool in Paleo Art, but considering the size of these animals, I'm not sure how practical that is. But um, still really, really cool, and I think it really gives a unique look to Giganotosaurus as well. It really helps it uh, distinguish itself from other large theropods. Uh, and then we can see that big round body there, similar to Cacarodontosaurus. They've got those high neural spines, and even Acrocanthosaurus. It's got those big spines there, probably help a lot of muscles. And then you've got that long, long tail. So definitely a big fan of that, like a long tail. Uh, as I keep mentioning, often way too short in uh, Jurassic Park uh, dinosaurs. But yeah, I love that design. I think it's come out beautifully. I'd like to see... Uh, like a Megaraxes edit on the Dominion one. I think the, the I think Wheat's one has the Megaraxes feet. I'll have to re I don't recall off the top of my head, but I think it'd be cool to cover that and show that off because I really like the patterns and stuff on that one. But really, really cool. I'll get back to you if I remember, but um, we'll have a look. So let's let them walk off and do their thing. So next up, we've got something a little uh, later, uh, a little later, a little later in the Cretaceous. Uh, kind of took over from the large Cacarodontosaurids in South America. We've got Maip Macrothorax by Master Dute. I'll let you walk off and do your thing. So this is a Maip Macrothorax. So this is actually quite a recent one, only just discovered in 2022. So these guys are a large Megaraptorid. Uh, so these guys are found in late Cretaceous, uh, from the Mastrichtian, so right at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, Troleno formation in Santa Cruz, Argentina, and is known from the single species Maip Macrothorax. And Maip is really unique, not only because it's the um, latest kind of 
uh, Megaraptorids found right at the end of Cretaceous. It's also the largest, so as we'll get into, and it's the largest known from South America and most likely the largest in the world. So the holotype was found in uh, El Canto Santa Cruz in 2019, so quite recently, and the fossil material that we have is kind of the dorsal caudal vertebrae, some ribs, a coracoid, scapula, gastralia, so the belly ribs, and a metatarsal, things like that. And um, was first announced as a preprint in 2021. And in 2022, the uh, material was described as a new genus. So, uh, Maip, it refers to a malicious being in Anotic mythology, which means the shadow of death, that kills in cold wind. And Macrothorax just described that this guy has a long thorax or a large chest and has a really large thoracic cavity, which is quite interesting. So as I mentioned, Maip is very cool because it's one of the largest Megaraptorans, uh, if not the largest. So it seems that these guys got about 9 to 10 meters long, or about 30 to 33 feet in life, and is the largest uh, Megaraptor currently known. And members of Megaraptor Day as a whole increased uh, in body length after the extinction of the Cacarodontosaurids in the early late Cretaceous. So uh, back uh, in the early late Cretaceous, you had like about 100 to probably... Uh, 80 million years ago, you had these large uh, animals. So you have like Giganotosaurus, Mapusaurus. Uh, those were kind of the top predators. But as they went extinct in the early late Cretaceous, look who stepped up to take their place, uh, Megaraptorids. So that became uh, Maip as kind of the end of that uh, kind of transition. So as the giant Cacarodontosaurids went extinct, the Megaraptorids kind of got bigger to make up for that loss, which is really cool. And it's also hypothesized that the absence of large predators, uh, apex predators, that allowed theropods to kind of diverse, uh, so kind of diversify. So megaraptorids, in addition to uh, abelisaurids and unilagids, which is a type of dromaeosaur, they became the primary, pred primary predators in the ecosystem. And um, analysis of megaraptorans, uh, all known, show that there's a clay that kind of comes from Asia, South America, and Australia that range from about four to four and a half meters long, or 13 to 15 feet, which are from earlier. But then there's the South American group that get up to larger. There's kind of two groups as we get through. And these early Tenorian foons, they increase, they get up to about six meters long in Australia and South America. And then right at the end of the Cretaceous, you get the largest members, which includes Maip, uh, about seven to 10 meters long, which is quite interesting. So in terms of their uh, classification or uh, phylogeny, Maip was described as a derived uh, Megaraptorid and is kind of in a group. There's two clades of Megaraptorids. So there's also noted that there's kind of two clades within um, Megaraptoridae. So there's kind of these two clades. is one that comprises all Megaraptorids except for Australovenita and Fukuya Raptor from China. I'm uh, not China, Japan. And uh, they belong in clade A, since that clade isn't named. And there's a more exclusive clade of uh, large South American megaraptorids, which are called clade B. And uh, these include animals as Maip, uh, Ocoraptor, and Aeustodon are examples. So that's kind of included there. And um, like pre previous analyses, uh, most of the time these guys are considered uh, sister to Tyrannosauridae. So they're kind of considered closely related to Tyrannosaurs. But... Megaraptor taxonomy, they're kind of all over the place, but most recently it's been shown their sister taxa to Tyrannosauridae. But um, what really makes it distinct is you can see, instead of getting these big heads like the Cacarodontosaurus and Tyrannosaurids, they got these big arms, which they would have used to cap, uh, grapple prey. And evidence from like Australia which is actually pretty well preserved, they were able to semi-pronate their hands, so they're probably much more reliant on grappling their prey, so they use their large and long arms to grab prey and then bite it, rather than just use their heads. So um, that shows like even they, so that they're being different and doing their own thing. And... It's, I think that's just cool. Like these guys, instead of getting big heads, they got big arms. And that shows how you can kind of find two different solutions to the same problem, which is killing big animals. So these the other guys got the big heads, and these guys got the big arms. And in terms of its paleoecology, these guys are from the Mestrictian dated uh, Colorado formation. And there are other dinosaurs known from there. There's, um, uh, there's, uh, it's, Asari cursor, which is a ornithopod, so it seems to be like a hadrosaur, uh, and Nulla titan, which is a titanosaurian sauropod, but there are many other animals found, such as ankylosaurs, eonguanodontians, hadrosaurids, noosaurids, which are a type of um, ceratosaur, or closely related to abelisaurids, 
and um, Uninlagins as well. So those are kind of dromaeosaurs related to like Ostroraptor, things like that, and have been recovered from this formation, but obviously not described yet. Uh, fossils also of like small frogs and fish, mammals, also mosasaurs have been found, snakes, turtles, and gastropods have been found. And um, there's also very uh, fragmentary remains, including teeth and a dorsal central in that it seemed to be Megaraptorin. But they're too uh, fragmentary to be assigned to Maip or any other taxa. So there may be another Megaraptorid living in the same formation of this guy, or it could just be another individual. But yeah, really, really cool regardless. Master Dude, I really do like this one. Very interesting color choice. I kind of like the darker one, though. I think the darker one fits best. But I still like the colors. Really, really cool. Did a wonderful job. So we're going to let these guys run off and do their thing. Hopefully you guys don't go anywhere near a hatchery. Don't want you guys anywhere near them. But uh, next up, we've got, as you see in the thumbnail, very, very interesting. We've got a new cosmetic uh, for Spinosaurus. That is the 2020 Spinosaurus and has all the new bells and whistles. So this is a new cosmetic of Spinosaurus. This is based on Suchomimus, and it's a smaller cosmetic. So it's uh, still Spinosaurus, but it's different rig, different model, different everything. So we can see some of the changes here. So this very much fits the 2020 interpretation of Spinosaurus, because the history of Spinosaurus has been quite interesting. In 2014, we found that it had really, really short legs. And then in 2020, we found that it's got a giant tail. That's a giant paddle shaped tail and after that there's been years of debate on whether how aquatic it was and all that and all that malarkey and i think it's hard to deny that these guys at least had their lives very very um dependent on water considering isotopes and a lot of the adaptations it has but um whether they were divers or pursuit predators and things like that um, people obviously can make papers and that for days and that's also definitions things like that but um really really cool so we can see some changes to the head there. I've got that very long neck, very heron-like, which has been suggested with some ecology. Uh, you can see the changes to the skull there. I'm definitely a big fan of these changes. I really love seeing an accurate uh, Spinosaurus. Uh, you can see that quite long uh, crocodile-like snout and uh, with the large teeth, that long neck, these large claws. Uh, obviously, we don't have really preserved... I think we do have preserved arms, but they're not described. It's very interesting to see uh, if those get described, if we get another big reinterpretation of Spinosaurus. But based on other um, kind of uh, Spinosaurids, like Suchomimus and things like that, these guys have very large claws that are hooked, very likely adapted for catching prey, uh, particularly fish. Same with those long jaws with that hook, really well adapted for capturing slippery prey. And then you can see that quite long body. These guys have a quite long, like, oval body. And these got shorter legs, as I mentioned, 2014. The interpretation, they have got much shorter legs than initially thought, as you can see here. And not the big one, like the 2001 Spinosaurus. It's in game. And then you have here the large sail. There's also many different interpretations of the sail. This one seems to be a more conservative one, like a kind of... But I do quite like it. it. looks really, really nice. And you can see the big change of 2020. We've got this large paddle-shaped tail. And we don't know exactly if it was a social thing or how it propel itself. I th most likely kind of propelled itself with it. But um, obviously there can be debates about that for days. But yeah, I really like that. It gives a really interesting look to the Spinosaurus. So this wonderful Spinosaurus, this is the fisherman skin. Uh, this was done by Furlong, uh, who's also done some really other wonderful cosmetics and games videos for life. But I just want to show you, I'm going to go into uh, the genome library and show you what they've done. So if we go into see Spinosaurus here, so we can go into modified genome. So you can see you've got the default variant, which is the normal Jurassic Park Spinosaurus. And then you've got the other cosmetic, which is the 2022 Spinosaurus. And not only have you got the random colors here, and see his size small as well, it's kind of similar to the Uranosaurus. You got, can mix the same similar colors that you got going on here as well. But you can see we've got over 40 
I believe that's what it, what it was last counted. 40 different uh, skins or variants for the um, Spinosaurus. So this pretty much covers all sorts of different um, skins from different Paleometer for the Spinosaurus. We have like uh, the Camp Cretaceous one. We have one from like Path of Titans. Uh, one from uh, the original description of the 2014 Spinosaurus. The Fisherman one that I have on here is based on like a life-size model, uh, which I really, really like. I thought that was a cool one to show off. So much Cap Cretaceous. Uh, many different types of paleo art. There's a Todd Marshall one, if I can find it. Uh, there's a Todd Marshall and Julius Cittoni, see? Based on different famous paleo arts uh, and um, reconstruction seen in both media and... Uh, paleo uh, paleo media like documentaries or movies or uh, press releases so pretty much any notable reconstruction really has kind of been put in here so up to 40 different skins you can see that's just so many and i think that's just so cool so i think this is definitely a mod worth getting especially if you love your accurate spinosaurus oh, so let's just go save and exit and have a look at you so look at this wonderful guy and you can see it's a little bit smaller than the original uh 20, 2021, uh, not 2021, 2001 Spinosaurus. So it's using that advantage of the body variants, things like that, that's been introduced, which is really, really cool. But yes, yeah, so awesome. I'm in love with it. It's just so nice. So, um, yeah, I think this is a great place to end the video. So thank you for everyone for making these wonderful mods. For along with that Spinosaurus, so awesome. Also Pickle and Master Dude and Jaserba, all really, really awesome mods. So, um... Yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always forget the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.